Well, welcome today. This is nice to have a little area of respite in this very busy Tuesday here at the museum. So this is the Islamic gallery of our Temple Palace Mosque series of galleries featuring our permanent collection on Southern Asian and Persian art. Um, each one of these spaces is art associated with different architectural environments and in this gallery we're focusing on art associated with a mosque which is the major congregational center uh, for Muslims around the world. And a mosque can be very, very simple. It can be anything that has a niche that orients the faithful in the direction of Mecca, um, the site where the uh, Prophet Muhammad first founded the religion of Islam, and the site of Medina close by where he actually um, turned his own courtyard of his own home into the very first congregational space known as a mosque. Now, um, Islamic art is something that is a little hard to define because it's a religion, but it stretches across so many different cultures and time periods and peoples around the world. Um, but one of the unifying features of Islamic art is um, the use of a mosque and embellishments um, associated with the mosque. Um, but there are such a wide range of attitudes about what, what properly constitutes Islamic art and whether or not a human figure is allowed to be represented presented in Islamic art. And so we'll get into that um, a little bit in today's short presentation. So our actual gallery here today um, is set up with one wall that orients the faithful in the direction of Mecca. That wall is called the Qibla wall, Q-I-B-L-A. And no matter where you are in the world, the Qibla will always orient you in the direction of Mecca, as it does actually in this gallery. And it's always marked by a blind niche. You know, unlike a church, which usually would have an image of Christ or a cross, mosques, uh, the central focus feature is, the, is a niche. The niche has nothing in it. It's blind, uh, meaning there is no figure. Um, there is simply, and it can be made out of textile, it can be made out of stone, it can be made out of any material at all. Um, sometimes a lamp will hang in front of the mihrab, which is the word for niche of, of the Qibla wall, um, that references the light of God. Um, but the Islamic tradition is very abstract in that way, in that the central feature um, is just an abstract niche um, in the wall. Um, also, a key feature of mosques is that they will often have a large copy of the Quran. Um, and we have here a very rare Quran, which is um, from the 15th century from northeastern India. So it's, a very, it's very unusual to be able to have such a large format uh, Quran um, surviving from this period, this early period in India. Um, and again, the Quran will have no figural imagery whatsoever. Um, the only embellishment one will see are um, abstract or geometric or floral patterns that might ornament the beginning of a rubric or a chapter uh, for a section of the Quran itself. The Quran itself, the contents of the Quran are considered to be divine revelation by the Prophet uh, from the Prophet Muhammad, recorded by the Prophet Muhammad as Allah, God, had directly uh, revealed to him. Um, he is considered to be a prophet, so he's transmitting the word of God, of Allah, uh, to the faithful. Um, and so calligraphy came about as being an extremely important art form in the Islamic world, and certainly considered to be the highest art form um, among uh, Muslim faithful, whether or not they consider figural imagery to be um, acceptable. Um, so these two pages uh, from the Quran, um, are also uh, written with commentary in the borders because actually the word of Allah and only in gold, uh, the name of Allah or God is written in the Quran here. And um, the word of Allah is actually a little hard to understand. Um, the, the, <laughs> the lines of text and the translations even are a bit cryptic. And so there are a lot of interpretations by holy men that followed Muhammad um, in time thereafter, um, explaining what the, what the meaning of the Quran is. And it's in these commentaries, we see some written in the borders, but then there are other 
other texts that are extended commentaries and explanations on the Quran, sometimes you know they can differ quite widely in their understanding. And so some groups follow different traditions, and some are very, very strict orthodox interpretations of the Quran, and others are rather loose and liberal. So we get a widely varying range of interpretations of Islamic law. Um, some of the more liberal forms uh, or most liberal um, interpretations of the Quran will allow a figural painting um, or even figural depictions. In this gallery, we see over here a small tile that would have been from a domestic site, from, but definitely from an Islamic context where there are human figures, princes and princesses in a garden with a romantic encounter, um, where it's e they're even shown in relief. Um, and sometimes there are paintings that have um, the, an image of Allah himself in figural form, sending his own light and blessings directly upon the Mughal emperor of India from the 17th century. Uh, but then there are very, very strict interpretations of, um, of the Quran where um, it's considered to be completely blasphemous to even render any figural depictions because it's sort of trying to be like in imitation of God himself. Um, and then there are more kind of middling interpretations that say, well, as long as they are simply two-dimensional depictions that don't cast a shadow, there's no problem. And it's perfectly fine to have depictions of figures um, in paintings and albums um, that are part of a courtly a connoisseurship environment. Uh, we have here also on view um, two paint, uh, pages from a prayer manual from a a group of Muslims of the Shiite community that tend to be quite strict in their interpretation, so we don't have any figural imagery at all, simply architectural imagery of the two most holy spots in the uh, tradition of Islam. Uh, there's the Kaaba itself. The Kaaba is a black stone cubic architectural temple that belonged to the pre-Islamic Arab followers of a divinity known as Baal. And after his, inter his revelation from God, Muhammad came down and cleansed that temple and made it a center uh, for the faithful um, followers of Islam. Um, and so the pilgrimage that, uh, that all Muslims are enjoined to take at least once in their lifetimes, the jihad, the holy pilgrimage, is to the Kaaba in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And then the second most holy site in Islam is the first mosque in Medina, which was built off the house of the Prophet Muhammad himself. And here we have the courtyard surrounded by arcaded pillars and a domed wall and the niche, the blind niche, the mihrab, that orients the faithful into to the direction of Mecca at the Kaaba. So we have a, you know, the public Quran that's for public readings of the Quran and then private prayer books that bring one almost like on a virtual pilgrimage to these most holy sites of Islam. Then um, there are other kinds of sacred images, uh, which this is the form of a lion, but it's, but it's made up of a work of calligraphy, which is one of the most important prayers, especially for Shiite Muslims. Um, they um, are especially look to the nephew of the Prophet Muhammad, whose name was Ali, um, to be as considered to be the rightful successor of the prophet um, and the first imam or spiritual leader. There's another branch that sees him as the fourth caliph or head. And so in very early on in, in Islam, there were divisions into branches for those who followed different spiritual teachers as the rightful successor of the prophet. Um, but here we have the prayer to the imam that states um, that God, you know, Allah is the only one God, that Muhammad is the most recent of all the prophets and the one true prophet and taking refuge in the saint Imam Ali himself, who then became martyred and there's an important festival that takes place every year commemorating the martyrdom of Ali. Ali was also known, he had a special epithet, um, which was the Lion of God, 
so Asad Ali, Asad being the lion, um, and he, and so therefore this special prayer dedicated to Ali himself is then worked into um, this form of the lion itself through special intertwining calligraphic forms. So even when some figural imagery is maintained in Islamic art, uh, very often calligraphy continues to form or to be part of the, um, the work of art in a very important way um, and even a kind of dominant way, even when um, figural imagery becomes part of the repertoire. Thank you very much for coming today.